Hi, I'm Chris Shaw, and this is ARMS Headquarters. And in ARMS 30th year, it's time to take a look back and see how it all started 30 years ago, right here in the city of Cambridge. This is a city full of history, of beauty, but most of all of learning and discovery. It's where there are constant reminders of the great scholars of the past. Here's a quick guided tour. Isaac Newton was a member here at Trinity College. Nearby, there's a plaque marking where J.J. Thomson discovered the electron. And here's another plaque. This one commemorates Alan Turing, who studied at King's College. And it was here, the Eagle Pub, that Francis Crick burst in one lunchtime to announce that he and James Watson had unraveled the structure of DNA. And Stephen Hawking was a fellow of this college, Gonville and Keyes, for more than 50 years. In another link with Stephen Hawking, he unveiled this unique clock, which is only accurate once every five minutes. And here at 4A Market Hill is a site we'll come back to later. Cambridge has been at the start of so many stories of discovery and invention. Today I'm going to start to tell just one of those stories. The story of how ARM grew to be the company it is today. And to do so we need to go back well before 1990, to when some young engineers had a vision. Chris Curry and Herman Hauser created Acorn Computers. Remember 4A Market Hill in the centre of Cambridge? That was Acorn's first office. To find out what happened next, we're going to a small village just outside Cambridge. There we're going to see where the dream started to become reality. I wasn't there then, but we're going to meet someone who was. This is the village of Swaffham Bulbeck. And this is John Biggs, one of the original gang of 12 who were the founders of ARM. So this is the famous barn? It is, yeah, this is where it all started in 1990. So John, just how old is this place? Well, we think it must be at least 250 years old because there's a piece of graffiti under the stairs on the old uh, beam there that says Harvey 1774. What was your first impression of the barn? Well, when I first heard about the barn, nine miles outside of Cambridge, I was a bit anxious about how far away it was. And also I'd heard Robin Saxby, who was, uh, he liked to call himself the damaging director, selected it because it was cheap. But when I got here, what a place. I knew we were going to be comfortable here. Even the banisters had acorn-shaped finials on them. It was unfurnished. That's right. One of the first things Robin had to do was negotiate a deal for the um, office furniture. And he won the boardroom table on a toss of a coin. <laughs> on the toss of a coin? Absolutely. And then on a roll, he decided to take the salesman down to the local pub and challenge him to a game of bar billiards for the desk drawers. And he lost. That's why we never had desk drawers at, in the <laughs> barn here. <laughs> So, why did Acorn decide to send you all out here rather than keeping you in-house? Well, if you remember, back in the 80s, the home computer market had collapsed and Acorn was running out of money and had been refinanced by Olivetti. And quite frankly, they just couldn't afford chip development. And what did it feel like to be sort of cast out into the wilderness by Acorn? Well, I must admit, we did feel a little bit unloved at the time. Acorn had tried to sell, sell us several times before. And it wasn't until the joint venture with Apple came along that it was a huge success. So I gather that Arm was here for about four years. So in that four-year period, what were the sort of key milestone products that were developed here in the barn? Well, I guess the most significant milestone product would be the Arm 610. That was the chip that we designed to go into Apple's Newton. And uh, the Apple Newton was the whole reason the joint venture was formed. Uh, what about significant early licensees? Well, I think the main milestone in terms of licensing was when we licensed Texas Instruments. That was a long, hard negotiation during 1993 and really uh, gave us credibility. And after that, I believe the uh, license deal with Samsung only took four meetings. Although Arm was only here for a few years, the decisions and the products that were made here shaped the destiny of the company. Ours is a young industry, and sometimes we don't pay enough attention to our history. But thankfully, there are... So here we are, 
at Cambridge's Centre for Computing History. This is a fabulous Aladdin's cave of artefacts from the history of our industry. Unsurprisingly, given that this is Cambridge, much of it relates to ARM. So, John, the first thing that draws my attention is this tiny little chip here. Just tell us about that. This is a, an engineering sample of ARM1 that actually I found under my desk in an old prototype machine a few years ago. And um, it's a three micron technology, 25,000 transistors, and it ran at six megahertz. Did it work first time? Of course it worked first time. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that when we were testing it on the bench, uh, the ammeter was showing no uh, current was being consumed at all. And it turns out that the test bench had a fault and the chip wasn't in fact being powered and it was running off uh, electricity it was able to harvest from leakage currents from the uh, other chips around it. So how do we connect that with the kind of processor you might find in today's mobile phones? Um, a typical processor you'd find in a smartphone today probably runs uh, um, 500 times the clock frequency, has maybe 400,000 times as many transistors and um, implemented in about the same area. But a direct descendant of the one that we're looking at right now. Yes, indeed. So we've come a very, very long way in 30 years. Oh yes, the relentless march of Moore's Law. So John, the next item that uh, we need to look at is this one here. Tell us about this. Oh, well this is an Apple Newton. And um, really it's a bit like an iPad, but 17 years too early. <laughs> What's the connection with ARM? Well, ARM was formed as a joint venture between Apple and Acorn to create the process of the ARM 610 that powers this machine. Why the joint venture approach? Um, I think Apple were somewhat reluctant to rely on a processor from Acorn and they were very keen to have access on it to the ARM because of its uh, extreme low power. And so the joint venture was formed. So this device is the catalyst that started it all. Indeed, yes. While the Newton message pad might not have taken off the way that Apple hoped it would, many of ARM's subsequent designs were extremely popular and very, very successful. And ARM adopted a tradition of cracking a bottle of champagne to celebrate each of those successful designs. And here in the museum, we can see the first four of those. Now, John, I know you have a special connection with this first one. Just tell us about it. Well, this, this one here, um, was opened on April the 26th, 1985, to celebrate the first ever working ARM silicon, at 3 p.m. to be precise, and you can still see the date on the label. And finally, John, I want you to tell me about this phone. Ah, yes, the uh, Nokia 8110, also known as the banana phone. This is the phone that Keanu Reeves used to save the world in the Matrix. <laughs> Great stories, but what's the ARM connection? Well, this is the world's first ARM-powered GSM phone. And inside here is an ARM7 TDMI integrated with a DSP chip made by Texas Instruments. This phone and its descendants sold in millions. So it's true to say, I think, that this phone really kick-started the explosive growth of ARM yeah. in the second half of the 90s and took it through that IPO in 1997. Thank you so much, John, for helping us bring the first 10 years of ARM to life. You're welcome, Chris, my pleasure. From a computer chip in a converted barn 30 years ago, ARM technology now touches 70% of the world's population. In the next instalment, our story continues. Out of the shadows, ARM enters the 21st century and comes into the public consciousness. 2000 to 2010, 10 more years that shook the world.